Welcome to the Institute of Jewish Knowledge and Learning. We're so delighted to be having Johnny Schneitzer live from Israel, bringing us the topic, Knowing Life Through Death. And I asked him to do us a favor because for personal reasons, um, Raphael, Simcha Raphael um, needed to reorganize his, um, reorganize us so that he's four weeks later. And um, Johnny had done a program for us that the universal reaction was, that was amazing. And so I made a little note to try to find the place to have him on the schedule. And when I called, it turns out that this class is right in the sweet spot, in his sweet spot of, um, so you'll tell us about um, your background and how fortunate we are to be learning with you. Take it away, Johnny. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, lovely to be here and uh, um, lovely to meet all of you here uh, on my evening in your uh, midday, noon. Um, so my name is Johnny Schnitzer, I live in Israel. Uh, my wife and I, Ilana, we have three gorgeous little rat bags. Uh, in Australia, that's a term of endearment for little kids that have a lot of energy, especially during COVID. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in Jewish philosophy, and my focus is on a, a medieval Kabbalist, 13th century Kabbalist by the name of Rabbi Yosef ben Shalom Ashkenazi. Uh, he wrote a very famous commentary on Sefer Yetzira, the book of creation, which is all about uh, how you take letters, combining them. Essentially, Sefer Yetzirah is a book about how God created the world and then how man can learn from this model how to create. Uh, and, and he gets a lot into reincarnation. In fact, it's the first text to systematically really try and explain what reincarnation is. We'll get there next week. Uh, and so when, when Kim called me asking if I'd be interested in you know, giving a class about death and dying, you know, uh, <laughs> It's, it seemed uh, that it's, it all fits in. Uh, if you notice that, so what we're going to be doing, uh, because I'm, my expertise is Kabbalistic material, Kabbalistic manuscripts, um, we are going to look at death, understanding death, the way Kabbalists and Midrash understood death. Um, we're going to come to some unexpected uh, outcomes. Um, and... But, but before that, what we're going to do today, before we hit the Kabbalah, which is only it's going to start next week, we're going to start with the basics. And that is, let's look into the Bible. Let's look into the Torah and see what, can we, what do we know about death from the Torah? And, and also here, I think we are going to be surprised. We are going to be shocked because it's not as simple as we think. And here again, we're not going to get into commentators, Rashi, Maimonides, Nachmanides. We are going to look at the literal verses. To be specific, we are going to look at five verses, very simple verses, and we are going to engage one another and try and understand what these verses are about. And as I mentioned, given that the Judaism is, is a religion that celebrates life, I think there's a lot to learn about life and how we should be leaving, living our lives through texts that deal with death. And so today we're going to start with the Bible. Uh, just before that, uh, uh, I'd like to start with a, with a, a short personal story to sort of uh, uh, set the tone and it'll sort of lead us to a question that hopefully will lead us a, as we go along. Um, so my, my babi, my father's father, uh, my father's mother uh, was called Chaya or Clara. Uh, she uh, uh, passed away some years ago and uh, she was, I was very, very close to, to, to Chaya, to my babi. Uh, you know, she comes from Rohatin, Galicia. That's where they eat sweet gefilte fish. Um, and, and right, it's that side of the river. And, and I will never forget the following story that my father told us um, when he was mourning, when he was sitting shiva, when his mother passed away, my babi. And he said the following. He said that Babi was, uh, during the Holocaust, we're talking around 1942, 1943 in Rohatin, um, my Babi and her sister Hinda went hiding in a cave. It's a cave, water up to the thighs. Later on in life, Babi got uh, arthritis due to this water. They were there for months. Uh, they would take turns. Who goes out of the cave to find a bit of food and come back? It was a cave not far from Rohatin. And one night, my Babi goes to sleep. And her father, Velvel, who I'm named after, my name is Johnny, but, but my, my name, when I go, I get an Aliyah or an Aktubah, my wife and I, it's Velvel. 
And her father, Velvel, comes to her in a dream. He comes to her in a dream, and he says to my Bobby, you will live. That's it. She wakes up. A few months go by. And at some point, her and Hinda start arguing whether it's time to leave. The, the water is it's getting difficult. We can't keep on like this. Bobby decides to stay in the cave, and Hinda leaves. Hinda leaves, and Hinda is, is killed. My Babi later on joins the underground in Rohatin. She was a very, very brave woman, uh, uh, and she helped the underground and the partisans afterwards until the end of the war. In any event, um, <laughs> we also know, I'll add one more historic fact. Uh, we know that, my, uh, that Velvel, her father, was already dead at the time of the dream. How do we know this? Because when she goes hiding in a cave, uh, his father, her father has already passed away. The Nazis came into a shul on Yom Kippur in Rohatin, everyone davening in the shul, and they, they murder everyone. So Velvel's dead. Velvel's no longer in this world. And yet my Babi has a dream. Velvel comes to her in a dream and says, you will live. He doesn't say anything about Hinda, says you will live. Now, you know how you have these stories that, that, that always you come back to and you think about, and, and one of the reasons I, I, I think about this story, and I, I'm, I'm emphasizing it's a story. We don't know what's real or not. We don't even know. My Bobby dreamt that dream. Does the dream mean that Velvel really came to her? Who knows? You know, you could read Freud. You could read the ninth chapter of the Tractate of Brachot to understand the psychology of dreams. And we could say it was just what, what she was thinking. But you can also view this story by... Velvel came to her because he wanted to tell her, you're going to live. He wanted to give her a shtickle, a bit of hope. And, and what I question, what I wonder, and what I'd like us to put in the back of our minds is, so what does it mean if Velvel, Velvel was dead, but he came to her in a dream? So we know he's no longer alive. We know he's no longer in this world. But if he's no longer in this world, what does that mean? Does it mean that's it, finito? Does it mean he is somewhere else in a better place? Does it mean he's down under? What's going on? That's what we're going to try and understand. We're going to try and understand what death is. Or, or, or we're not really going to understand what death is. We're going to try and understand texts that discuss death. Kabbalistic minds, Midrashic minds. Today, we're going to focus on the Bible to try and understand this. By the way, just in brackets, as I told you the story, it reminds me of a, uh, one of the greatest intellectuals today, a really great intellectual. I don't know if you've read his books, Nassim Taleb. Nassim Taleb was a mathematician, a, a, a dealer on Wall Street. His famous book, I think, was The Black Swan. It's about how, how we perceive, how, how, we, how we learn, how information passes from one place to another. And interestingly, Nassim Taleb, in a beautiful passage, compares between academic material, right, non-fiction books that are supposedly facts, as opposed to stories, novels, Besheva Singer, Shai Agnon, Doris Lessing. And he says it's very interesting. When you read academic material, a book that is supposedly uh, uh, objective, you assume you are going to find truth in these articles, in this material, because it's objective. There are objective tools. However, it is very tricky and misleading because we all know that there are subjective thoughts and emotions that, that are at the foundational basis of these studies. That's, that's just human nature. Whereas stories, interestingly, stories we know are, are make-believe. And yet stories are so powerful because th there is some grain of truth in every story, be it from, from an emotional feeling, from something that happened. And, and so having that in mind, it matters less whether Velvel coming to my Babi in a dream really came or not, whether we take Nassim Taleb this way or that. But, but, but what we want to try and understand is what does it mean that what happened there, right? So, so what is death? Before we begin, uh, and by the way, just one more thing. If anyone wants to ask a question in the middle, I don't know if technically, logistically it's possible, you can feel free, we can discuss if you have a chat question. When we get to the verses, if you want to add something in, it would even be great if we have a bit of a conversation. Don't have to if we don't want to, but that would really it would enrich the experience. Before we start looking into the biblical passages, uh, because we're going to look at them in English, 
I'd like to first focus on two words in Hebrew so that we just look at them. Even if we don't speak Hebrew, don't understand Hebrew letters, all we need to know is that the top word is met, dead. Okay, this, this, you know, there, there's, there's Kabbalists also like uh, rabbis in the Talmud were, were fascinated with not only what words mean, but what we can derive from the shape of letters and words. Right? It was called Sod HaTumuna, the secret of the picture, what we can learn by simply looking at the letters. And in this sense, we don't, even know how, we don't even need to know how to speak a language. We can simply look at the text, look at the letters, and try and understand what they tell us. So the first word says met, dead, death. Okay. Interestingly, now we're, our, our goal today in, this, in these four weeks is going to be to understand what death means or how Jewish texts view death. Interestingly, the very same word, if you flip it upside down, flip it backwards, there are only two letters here, mem and taf. Mem and taf together are met, dead. If you reverse them, and as we know that in Judaism, the power of a letter, the meaning of a, of a word, sorry, is its numeric value. So if we reverse the word dead, we still keep the same numeric value. All of a sudden we have tam. Tam is not only also concluding or a conclusion, but it also means complete. It also means perfect. Now, I find that fascinating. Danny, because, don't we also yeah. know it from one of the sons at Passover? The yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. Fascinating. So, so exactly, we have, brilliant, we have the four sons in Passover, right? The, the, the righteous son, the good son, the evil son, the one that doesn't know how to ask any questions, and the tam, right? And, and the tam, you know, it's interesting because we always get confused between the son that doesn't know how to ask a question, and the tam, the sort of simpleton. So, so what do we need the one who doesn't know how to ask questions for? And then th that, that strengthens the point that, that, you know, what is this? It's Tom. He's a mystery. Perhaps perfect. That's why he doesn't, he doesn't have what to ask. So on the one hand, we have death. We have dead. And if we flip it on its head, if we look at it in the mirror, literally the mirroring effect of dead is perfection, is completion. Okay, so let's, let's put that in the back of our minds with Velvel. And let's, let's, let's get into our journey. Let's go back in time. As I mentioned, we, we can't, um, oh, we have here in the chat, let me just check. Um, um, uh, Johnny, did I get to Oz from, yes, I'm, I'm, so I didn't say this, yes, my, I'm, I'm Australian, uh, as we say in Hebrew, from, you know, my, part of my many sins, one of them is that I am Australian. I've been living in Israel for over 30 years, which means I've lost all my bloody manners, so forgive me. Um, Now let us go now. We can't start with the Kabbalists before we look at the actual texts in the Torah and the Bible and understand for ourselves so that we can after this lesson say, you know what, we've looked at the, the, the monumental, monumental passages that deal with death and, and, and this is what they have to say. Once, just before we read this, okay, because we are going to end with stories. The first part's looking at verses. Once we finish looking at our verses, we are then going to look at, in my view, the most fascinating midrash, the most fascinating commentary, which tells us about the few people who the Bible did not kill. The few people who never died. Okay, we're going to conclude with that because through those who didn't die, we're actually going to learn perhaps a lot about death and even more about life. Okay, so our first verse, but of the, and this, is, this is the first time the word death appears in the Bible. Right, so Genesis 2, we, we, we read it this week. But of the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat thereof. For on the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, as I mentioned, if, if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free to, to sort of, you know, we can do this in a civilized manner, unmute yourself, say what you think. Um, because uh, I, I think it'll make it more interesting. If not, then I'll, I'll go ahead with my thoughts, but your thoughts interest me more. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts, feel free to, to jump in. And what, what do we understand yes. death means from this I passage? Do. Yes. Yes, Shabi. Uh, well, we took this up, this particular 
verse up with Rabbi Akiva, and we discovered that at that time, uh, there was nobody knew what that really meant, what surely dying was this what, how could how could you relate to that? Exactly, right? it's like right. It's it's like a, a six year old that's just learned how to read and write, and and yeah. they read this verse. What's death? Yeah. Like yeah. So, so what is it? What can we understand from this? Ver what do you? Th what, so what what do you take? If let's say we, we we don't know, what can we guess about death from this verse? I I would guess that it's not so good because it says you're not to eat this, and if you eat it, you're going to die. Uh, it's 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 pointing to the fact that whatever dying means is not so good right so exactly so spot on all we can perhaps all we can understand from this is that dying equates to going against god's will right so it's it's not a good thing it's a negative outcome to not listening to what god wants but we don't yet know what it means we just know that so meaning we don't even know if perhaps right Eating, uh, it, could be, it could mean from the verse, I could understand this verse to mean that death means um, knowing the secret of the tree of good and bad, right? I've eaten from it. God doesn't want me to know something. I'm eating from it, and now I know a secret. Now I know something, and now everything's going to change. Who knows? But, but, but as you mentioned, spot on, from this first verse, the first time death appears, we have no idea what it means but we know it's something negative. Now, let's keep that in mind because we are going to visit passages where it is the exact opposite of negative, okay? So this is our first verse, the beginning. By the way, the snake, interestingly, a few, I don't bring the next verse because it's, it's similar, but the snake, when he convinces Eve to eat from the apple, he says to her, you know, it's all well, apple, not really apple. He says to her, you know, surely you will not die. Even from the snake's temptation, we don't yet know what it is. He's just saying that bad thing God said, it won't happen to you. Don't worry. We still don't know what it is. But okay, that's our first verse. Now our second verse, this is already in the book of Exodus, right? So we're a book down. We're sort of a few months down the track. Now the plot thickens. The plot thickens because, okay, so you shall observe the Sabbath for it is holy to you. Its desecrators shall be put to death, for whoever does not whoever does work on it, thou soul shall be cut off from among its people. Now here's a question. Are we talking here about two punishments? Are we saying that someone who desecrates Sabbath is going to be put to death and cut off from amongst and their soul is going to be cut off uh, from among its people? Or are we saying this is where the Bible is telling us what death is. You want to know what death is? Death is the soul being cut off from among its people. And if it means, death means the soul being cutting off from its people, which people? From mankind, in which case your, your soul's cut off, or from the Israelites. So does it, if anyone, again, if anyone would like to jump in here and say, you know, their thoughts, love to hear it. If not, we'll elaborate and move on. Feel free. Okay. So, so this second verse really is even more perplexing because in the first verse, we knew death is a bad thing. We understood that. We didn't know what it is. And now it's kind of like the text is teasing us and saying, you know, so again, it, the similarity to the, to the Adam and Eve story is that here too, God is saying to us, this is what you need to do. And if you don't do this, there'll be death. Okay, so we already know death is God's favorite punishment when we don't listen to him. Okay, we still don't know what it is. But then what does the second part of the sentence mean? By the way, in Hebrew, it's karet, right? So we have mavet, death, and karet, being cut off, being uprooted. Now, we also have here a sort of a, a, a metaphysical kvetch, because in the beginning, we talk about death, right? Someone dies. Uh, we, we don't know what that means. But, but by, by the way, actually, sorry, let me correct that. We do know what death means. Up to, if this, in, with, with Adam and Eve, we didn't know yet what death meant. By this point in Exodus, we already know what death means. Why? Because when Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, Rachel, when anyone dies in the Bible, what happens to them? 
they no longer appear in the text. Hence, they are no longer amongst the living. Right, so, so we could deduct this by simply right, but by not the negative, right? The, the, the Adam and Eve shtick is the first time we learn about death in a negative connotation. But then there are many other connotations, which I didn't bring, where we know the characters die, they don't appear anymore. If they don't appear anymore and I'm a six-year-old, I might think, okay, death means that you know, you're no longer in the play. You've gone somewhere else. So when I read this verse, I can already start to understand that whoever desecrates the Sabbath is also no longer in the play. Okay, but what about the second part? Does that mean that my soul is cut off or that's an added punishment? This verse we will come back to when we deal with our Kabbalists because Kabbalists are going to, are fascinated with what happens to us when we die and what does death even mean? Uh, and we're going to get into the differences. So we're going to come back to some of these. We're going to revisit these passages and to look into this. And, but on face value, it's not obvious. We're not sure here if death means the soul is cut off from its people or does it mean that, you know, Someone desecrating the Sabbath is going to die, no longer be here. And in an afterlife, wherever you go, I'm telling you now you have a soul. That soul is not going to go to where all the other souls go because it's going to be cut off from its people. Who knows? Okay. So we're a bit confused. We've gone through two passages. Okay. Now we're going to get even more confused. Now it's going to get even more perplexing because now all of a sudden we're going to meet for the first time a positive aspect of death. Okay, so we're now in Numbers. We've, we've skipped a, another book, two books. The assembly shall rescue the killer from the hand of the avenger of the blood, and the assembly shall return him to the city of refuge, we'll give context in a moment, where he had fled. He shall dwell in it until the death of the Kohen Gadol, until the death of the high priest. So what are we talking about here? Um, it's very interesting because, so just in a brackets, anyone who reads, you know, um, sociological, criminological, anthropological, psychological studies over the past, I don't know how many years, comes to a very simple conclusion that mental institutions and prisons were historic accidents. The first actual prison was not intended to be a prison. It was because we had no more boats to put criminals on. We didn't know what to do with them. We started a prison and all of a sudden we start putting all these people that committed crimes, be it on purpose and be it uh, by accident, in the same place. And that creates a sort of negative environment. Uh, my point being, interestingly, the Bible is full of punishments. Um, prison does not appear in the Bible. There is no such thing as a prison in the Bible and it makes you wonder about prisons. However, there is one exception. There is one exception in the Bible to a kind of quasi-prison. What's that? So what are we talking about here? Anyone who commits manslaughter in the Bible, right? You killed someone, it's a horrific, tragic thing, but it was an accident. You didn't mean for it to happen, it happened. So there were six, there were cities, there were several cities scattered around Israel that didn't belong to anyone. The Leviites kind of, you know, it was controlled by others. And you went there why? Because you killed a person by accident. There was fear that the family of the deceased was going to go and avenge your blood, was going to, right, as we see here. So you went to a place, to the city of refuge, Irmiklat, and you waited. How long were you in the city of refuge? Until the high priest died. Now, what, what, what's the connection? So, so, by the way, th this passage is fascinating because this passage tells us even more. What does it tell us here? Nobody wanted to be in a city of refuge. Look, what is the scenario telling us here? It tells us that someone escaped the city of refuge, right? Someone didn't want to be there because who wants to be in a city full of people who committed manslaughter? Imagine how dreary, how depressing. Everyone here, the common denominator of all of us, we're in the city of manslaughterers. Horrific. So a guy runs away. The assembly rescue him because he's run back to town. He's left the city of refuge. And now the assembly, the sort of, you know, the high court have said, okay, look, the, the, the family of the deceased are about to kill him. Quickly retrieve him, put him back there. And they put him back. And you're not allowed to leave until the high priest dies. Now, this is fascinating because this is the first passage that we see where death has a positive connotation. 
it has nothing to do with, at least not in face value, with, right, up until now, the first two verses we visited was you do something wrong, you're going to get death. Not sure what that is. By the second scene, second uh, uh, verse, we already understood it kind of means you're no longer here. Not sure what happens to the soul. But here, all of a sudden, we're told, you get to go free from the city of refuge. You get to go back to your home. You made a mistake. It could have happened to anyone. When do you get to go home to see your kids, to see your wife, to see your husband, your grandkids? When, the, when you hear news from Jerusalem, the high priest has died. That must be the best day in your life. The high priest has died and you're going, woo I'm going home. This is perplexing. So what we have here in this verse, and again, anyone that wants to, to cut in, feel free any moment. I'd much rather hear your voices. What we have here is death equals atonement, right? That, that's what we see here. High priest dies. Yeah, uh, Debbie. Debbie raised your hand. Would you like to say something, Debbie? The first thing that came to my mind is how the Christians have taken that Jesus dies for your sins. I, I never thought of that, how they might have gotten it. And that might be the verse. That's... <laughs> Debbie, that's fascinating. Uh, in fact, that's definitely worth looking into. Even I'd even go further in saying, looking into the, you're right, you know, looking into the sort of the, 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 the early uh, uh, verses, I'm not sure if it would be in New Testament, but perhaps in, you know, uh, early commentators, but definitely. Because, yeah, you're right. This is a first model, in fact, the first sacred text, fascinating point, that says death is atonement. And, and yeah, amazing. Wow. I did not even look at, wow, that's, thank you so much for that. That's, I'm going to look into that. Fascinating point. Wow. Uh, so, so death is atonement. I have a question. I have a question. But aren't yes. they setting it up? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Aren't they setting um, it up for people to pray for the death of the Kohen Gadol? I mean, oh, so, okay. So, so Jackie, okay. So I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I, I, was, I, um, I spoke to my mom today. And I told her this passage about the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest dying of atonement. And she reminded me of a midrash I'd forgotten. She says, do you remember the story that the, the mothers of the Kohen Gadol or the mothers of the Kohenites would make the yummiest food and they'd ship it, no joke, they'd ship it to the city of refuge. Why? So the people would be happy so they wouldn't pray for the death of the high priest. You're spot on. You're spot on. <laughs> This, you, you, Jackie, you, you've, you've found where the, the basis of this midrash. Where does this midrash come from? Saying that the mothers made food for the, for the, it's, right? Yeah, it's insurance. It's life insurance. Exactly. It's like saying the moment that my son dies, your deal is over. You, you're no longer getting your, your free meal, right? It's spot on, spot on. We have, we have Deborah Lesk up next. Yes, Deborah. So first of all, <clears throat> um, I would say that um, the death of the high priest is, might be good for the people this, in the city of refuge, but not necessarily for the high priest. So it's not <laughs> such a positive thing always. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I don't understand, what I don't understand is when the high, when, why is it that when the high priest dies, it sets the people free? What is it about that? So, so brilliant question, Deborah. Uh, so, so like I said, uh, I purposely, forcefully, before we get into Kabbalah the next few weeks, I want us only be, to be dealing with the verse itself without getting into, you know, a 13th century commentary, a 10th century. Let's just understand. So you're right. If I read this verse, I don't understand it. I, so let's go back to the first thing, the first comment you made, and this goes back to what Debbie was saying about Jesus, perhaps, right? That, that, that we have here this, this model of a burden, that the high priest, from the very beginning, the role, perhaps some could say like the Israelite people, right? The Israelites, the deal with God at times doesn't seem like the best deal, right? You, you ha it's, it's a one-sided deal. God says to us, this is what's going to happen if you don't do it. This is what's going to happen, you know, if you do, but, but what? what Where's our assurance that God will always be there? Agreements have to be two-sided. This is an asymmet asymmetrical deal, right? It doesn't make sense. So, so the, the, the concept of burden, 
in, in the, is embedded in the Bible between this covenant, supposed covenant, it's a unique covenant because no other covenants are like this, a covenant between the Israelites and God. And you could even perhaps argue that there's a parallel between the, 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 the grand priest, the, the, the high priest, and the Israelites. There's this asymmetry, that, and, and you're right, it's fascinating. I didn't think about this. It's, 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 it's like, for them, it's great. And you could add one more. Not only for the Kohen Gadol is it not great that he dies, but also for the Israelites, right? That the president, imagine, right, like the chief rabbi has just passed away. Everyone, everyone's miserable. So, 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 so the majority of people are not happy. And yet this verse is telling us this is good news for these people. Right, so, so I, I, I purposely, I don't want to bring commentators. This is, and, and let's think of this. Again, think of the first two verses. What, we, we suddenly have this sort of three-dimensional, complicated picture of death that, and, and it's going to get even more complicated. Okay, believe it's going to get much more complicated. So, so let's, go, let's move on now. If there are any more questions, we'll move on now to the next passage. This one's, you know, just to sort of confuse us a little bit. Um, See, I have placed before you today the life and the good and the death and the evil. Now, this is interesting because, and we're not going to, unless anyone has any comments, the reason I brought this is because supposedly there seems to be this equation here with, okay, so we know that good is good because we know that the Bible tells us in certain times that good behavior is rewarded and evil is, you know, uh, you get a punishment. But we still don't understand the relationship here between life and death, especially if we think about the fact that, as I mentioned before, I didn't bring these passages, but when Abraham dies, you know, he reached an old age. Sarah dies. She reaches an old age. She had a good life. Jacob, you know, Esau, we could argue, but, you know, and, and, and comes the end. Is death a bad thing for them? Is it the opposite of life? This, this even, and we'll, we'll, we'll see this when we, when we head to the Kabbalists, try and think of the difference between opposites of things and extremes or contraries. Is this pasuk, is this verse, uh, 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 is the equation opposites of things or extremes, uh, uh, the contraries? And they're different. They're not the same thing, right? Saying life and absence of life is not like saying life and perhaps death being something else. You know, I, I, I already will jump into a certain Kabbalistic text for a moment. There's a Kabbalist that raises this and says, you can't possibly tell me that death is the opposite of life because that's not fair. Because if, if death is the opposite of life, it simply means absence of life. And if it's absence of life, then what? A person who killed one person is like a person that killed a thousand people. They're both just, their life is absent. So where's the pun? It doesn't make sense. So for that Kabbalist, who we will talk about next week, death is something far worse. A certain aspect of death. There are other aspects that, that are even uh, uh, beautiful. Okay, so, so, so I've just brought this verse because it seems when we read this, think of how many times we've looked at this verse and think, oh, it's obvious. It's not obvious at all. We don't know anything about death in this verse. We're still, we've reached the end. We've reached Deuteronomy. We should know by now what death is. We have no idea what death is. We're back in the Garden of Eden. We're children. Final verse in the Bible before we move on to this fascinating Midrash. And this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, bestowed upon the children of Israel before his death. Now, this verse is absolutely fascinating. There is only one time in the Bible that Moses is called Ish Elohim, man of God, and it's here. Moses is never called the man of God. This is the first time. And when does he get to be called the man of God? On his deathbed. On his deathbed, he is the man of God. Not only that, now get this, on his deathbed is the first time that Moses blesses the Israelites. He's never blessed them before this. Now, here's a trivia question. Who is the first character to bless the Israelites in the Bible? Right? We became a people in Egypt. Who is the first one to bless us? Does anyone know? Yes, Debbie. You got to unmute yourself. Aaron. No. Um, oh. Balak or Balaam or the... 
close. That's getting closer. There was a guy before Bilam. He's the second guy. Okay. Yitro. Mm. Jethro. Jethro, when he meets Moses, right, the, the sort of the, the, the family reunion after the Exodus, he blesses the Israelites. He, God doesn't do it. Moses doesn't do it. Nobody does it. Why does Jethro get the title of a, of a parsha? He's the first guy to bless the Israelites. And yeah, Bilam is the second one. Fascinating. Two non-Jews. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but according to Midrash, there is a, there is a, a common past that uh, Jethro and Bilam share. They were both the advisors of, of Pharaoh when he came up with his final solution. The idea of throwing the boys into the Nile so that the girls could be assimilated Guess what? Jethro and Bilam, they were both in on it. But then Jethro did tshuva. Jethro repented and he left. He said, I'm not staying here. Can't do this anymore. He ran away. He's the first one to bless them. And Bilam still didn't learn his lesson, but he was forced to bless them. So, but back to Moses, because that's not our business. That's a different lesson. We have here on Moses' deathbed, is the first time he's called man of God, which is a good thing, one would think. And it's the first time he blesses the people of Israel, which begs the question, why does he bless them on his deathbed? So uh, I know that you started your, your travels to North Africa. Uh, uh, so, so, I'm gonna, uh, so there's a fascinating, fascinating rabbi. He's my favorite. He's one of the greats to come out of Meknes, Meknes, uh, Morocco, Rabbi Raphael Birdugo, a.k.a. the Angel Raphael. He wrote a fabulous commentary, 18th century. He wrote a fabulous commentary on, on, uh, on the Bible. Um, he wrote several, but one of them that he wrote, and he says, what is Moses doing here? Right, because we read this last week. He says, Moses is following the footsteps of the fathers, right? And surely the mothers did this as well. The text just simply doesn't tell us this, but surely they did. So what happened? Abraham on the day he dies, Isaac on the day he dies, Jacob on his deathbed, they give a bracha, they give a blessing. Why? There must be something about the day you're dying that is very special. That This verse only hints to it. In our final class, in three weeks or four weeks, we are going to visit literally, intimately, the most famous deathbed of a Kabbalist in Jewish history uh, to see what he had to say and what happened the day he died and, and how opposite it is of, of death and how he lived more than ever. But, but so anyway, we, we, we can only perhaps guess here and jump in if you have any thoughts that there's a reason Moses has waited until the day he dies because there is a certain power on the day a person is going to die and this leads us to, to something interesting that we're going to see with Kabbalists. In the world, usually when we look at death or we look at life, the graph kind of goes like this. You're sort of young, you have a lot of power, you go, and then you sort of, it goes down. But according to this verse, it's linear and it's only going up. If you're willing to learn, if you're willing to, to evolve every Rosh Hashanah, that on your deathbed, it is going to be the most powerful, it's going to be your peak. There is no this. There is only this. We see this from the fathers. We see this from Moses. He becomes his highest level of prophet, man of God, the day he dies. So what is death? Right? He, he blesses them on the day he's going to die because there's some power in that day. What is death? Right? And, and the, by the way, notice that the verse, there's, there's no word that is, is, is you know, left for no reason. The verse is telling us purposely, it's important to say that he did this. He was called Isha Elohim, that he blessed them just before he died. So death is here. It's important to be here. So what is death? Right? So at this point, we've, we've, we've surveyed five verses, only five verses. Uh, now, feel free, next lesson, if you find other verses, bring them in by all means. These, to me, seem to be good representations of the complexity of death. And more than anything, to tell us that even though, uh, De yes, Deborah. Oh, <laughs> I had my yes. hand up for a while. You've moved on a bit. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. I'm but, sorry. I only saw it now. Yes. Um, is it like with Moses, could it be that it's on 
at his deathbed. He's had such a love-hate relationship with the Israelites and he's had so much trouble and then things come back and is it maybe like, you know, this is the very end and after all they are good people. So like I need to be end on a positive note. Is that, could that be why he did it that way? So, or then he, why you get blessed them then. So here's an interesting homework. If you like, um, go look at what Jacob said the day he died. Go look at what Jacob said. Um, very different to what Moses said. Um, Jacob does not have positive things to say. That's the truth. Uh, to, 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 to Judah, he does, right? Uh, to Joseph, he does. He loves Joseph. Um, to Benjamin, he does. That's about it. Um, now, now there, there, there are many ways of looking at what happened back then. Some commentators, to be fair, say it says that he blessed them, but then the words that we are told are not the blessing, but they're more like, here are your worst qualities, now watch out. And he's actually doing them, you know, justice. You know? But here with Moses in Vezot Bracha, there is no doubt these are great things he's saying. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, just to add on to what you said, um, Rabbi Rafael Birdugo, the same Moroccan Kabbalist we just mentioned, um, he actually says that if you read the blessing of each tribe, there is one common thing. And that is that he is preparing each and every one of them for the war in Canaan when they go in with, with Joshua. He's giving them practical advice. It's more than that. It's way more than just a blessing. It's literally a blessing that's going to keep them alive, uh, whatever that means. Uh, yeah, so we have other, other hands before we move on. Yes, my hand yes. is... Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's Brenda. Yes, Wouldn't Brenda. he be most insightful at the time he's ready to die? He would be most insightful at that time because he's lived his life and he sees it as it is and he has, um, there is no reason to hide anything or to sugarcoat anything. And so like Jacob tells it as it is, Moses is with his beloved people and they just tell it. I'm being 81, figure I'm living on borrowed time um, and I certainly don't want to tell my children any falsehoods. I no, want but, to be real. But then how, so that, that makes perfect sense. But then what do you make of it saying Isha Elohim, man of God? Is that the sort of biblical way of saying, you know, what you're talking about, like a way of saying you're insightful because, you know, like you're right. Yeah. With the blessings and you have nothing left, but what is Isha Elohim? And why is that associated with the day he's on his deathbed? Well, because people will listen to you more. Interesting. They know this is the last chance. They come around. Uh, Jacob's children all came around. Everybody comes around. So it, it, it's, it's a, so you're saying it's like by, by saying Isha Elohim, it's like a, it's, it's, dram, it's a drama, creating more drama to like, look, this is a monumental moment. Like with some of the Kabbalists, they had their followers around them at the time they were ready to go. And they said momentous things uh, like, I don't know, that they weren't, didn't do, lead a right kind of a life. And some of the people said around them, no, 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 you were, you know, they, their regrets, their whatever. I mean, this is the time, if not now, when? If not, yeah, that, definitely. I think that's a great point. I, I think you can... There's no doubt that reading the text, and especially you're right, if you compare it to Jacob, hands down, that makes perfect sense. A hundred percent. Very. So you're saying you downplay the kind of like spirituality of the day, and you're saying let's be practical. You're you're 81. You're this. So you have what to say. You're insightful. You're going to say it. That makes perfect sense. I mean, Johnny, you're not going to lie on your deathbed. You, you're what you're saying makes. A hundred percent sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that point. Yes. Do we have more before we move on? I'm sorry, no. by the way, before I miss the hands. Yes, Brenda. Um, my name is Annette. I raised my hand. Do you yes. see me? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I would really like if you would put the, uh, um, the Hebrews so that I can compare because the minute you put it in English, it's already a commentary. 
and I would like to see the actual Hebrew in front of me. But the other uh, comment I have is that you said that um, um, as, as you reach death, it's not going down, but going up. And with Moses, um, it did say that Lonas uh, Lecho, which would be um, proving your point, but not everyone reaches death in their heights. You can become um, not very functional, and that then what what's the difference between that point and the point that you raised? that at the end you don't go down but you actually still go up so i i i think the the idea so it's not every remember i stress that the idea is there is a potential uh that it's not something that and i'm putting aside uh mental physical capabilities but there is there's clearly in the text and we're going to see this in in kabbalah that there is this potential there's this idea that assuming you get to a certain stage and you get there clear-minded, only at that stage, you can, you can reach a height that you simply cannot reach beforehand. If that makes sense. Yes, it does. Uh, the minute you clarify yourself by saying that if you're still in your mentors, then I understand it. Okay, so it's not everyone. Uh, no, it's no, I said potential, like but yes. You, so I thank like you. you. Thank you very much for that point. And I, I, I take your point and you're absolutely right about the Hebrew. I should have put it, uh, even though, by the way, with this specific verse, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's probably the verse that is most as is, you know, uh, you know, but, but, but I'll, 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 I'll bring it for next time or I'll, on the last slide, you'll see my email. I'm happy to send these verses to anyone who wants. I'll send the Hebrew as well. You're absolutely right. Next time any verses I bring or passages, I'll bring them in Hebrew and English, it's especially you, when we're dealing with Torah. You're absolutely right. Um, okay. So, so we finished now with our five passages. And I'd like to now conclude um, with, so these are our five passages. And as I mentioned, uh, next time or, or anyone who emails me, I will send the, 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 the Hebrew. Um, we are now going to move on to a Midrash uh, that appears in the El Kuchimoni. The El Kuchimoni, um, it's a bit ambiguous. It's, we're not sure when, when this midrash, when this commentary appears. Some think it's the 13th century, perhaps in Ashkenaz and Germany. Um, we're not sure. But what we do know is that the midrash I'm about to bring um, is a sort of... Uh, <laughs> kind of puts together pieces of a puzzle of several other earlier Midrashim that deal with the exact same story. Okay, and what is the story since we're dealing with death? 13 people did not taste the taste of death and they are. Now in Hebrew, it is, it's very simple in Yalkuchimoni. This is by the way for, uh, in Ezekiel 28. The reason, by the way, I'll just give you a background. The reason this Midrash, uh, talks about the people that didn't taste the taste of death. We're not sure what that means, of course, um, is because one of the people is Hiram, Hiram, the king of Tyre, Melech Tzur. Uh, he was the guy who um, sent, he, he made a pact with King David and then sent the wood, the cedar wood for Solomon, building different parts of the temple. Um, and there is a tradition that says that he lived for hundreds of years. He then lives on to the time of Ezekiel and, and, it's, and, and later on, he becomes someone, he goes from being a good guy to someone who thinks that he's a god. Uh, in fact, the Zohar has a fascinating midrash about Solomon and Hiram and a demon, but I'm not sure we have time for that. We can perhaps leave that for next time if anyone's interested. But anyway, because the passage in Ezekiel is talking about the king of Tyre, the Melech Tzur, we get the following uh, midrash. And it says, uh, uh, so in Hebrew, it's Shloshasar Bnei Anashim, or Bnei Adam, so 13 people did not taste the taste of death. Now, interesting that it says, it doesn't say didn't die. It says, didn't taste the taste of death. Not sure what that means. Enoch, Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, Methuselah, Hiram, the king of Tyre, 
Ebed Melech. Ebed Melech was, so in the time of the prophet Jeremiah, he's one of the guys around that time, we might touch upon him in a moment. Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, she is my favorite character in all the Bible. Uh, Sarah, the daughter of Asher. Serach, the daughter of Asher. Uh, the three sons of Korach, Elijah, the Messiah, and Rabbi Joshua ben Levi. Now, before we move on, is there anyone in this list of 13 people that I've read out that, that seems to you like an oddball? For me, it was Eliezer because of the role that he played in bringing the wife. And in so, what sense? Um, that there was a certain honor that he was given. Like I know, maybe it's just that I know those stories better, mm -hmm. but Eliezer, when he brought back the wife uh, for Yitzchak, um, that seemed like something that he'd sworn to do and was a very holy task. So mm -hmm. that one felt immediately, and then like, why would, why would the sons of Korak be given an honor? So you have one who you can see is given an honor and one who is like evil, the son of evil. Right, so, so we so, have here a mix. I guess maybe the son of evil is more surprising than the one who had the a holy mi mission completed. Okay, okay, I interesting. Uh, Brenda, you raised your hand. Be Pharaoh's daughter. So Why? She felt like an oddball because she's the one that's not Jewish. Interesting. Very interesting. So we'll, we'll touch upon her in a moment. Like I said, she's my favorite character, so we can't not speak about her, uh, talk about her. But, but if you ask me, the a oddball vampire. out here. Yes, yeah, sorry, there's someone else. I say the vampire. The, who said that? Annette. Annette, I, I promise you I was just about to say that. Brilliant. Why the rabbi? Out of time and place. Exactly. Everyone else is biblical. He's the only rabbi, right? He's Talmudic. This is fascinating. Elijah, the Messiah, Enoch, Eliezer, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi. Like, you know, there's this concept in Judaism, pichut adorot, this idea that, you know, the, 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 the uh, digression of generations, right? That, that our, we're not as good as our parents, our kids aren't as good, you know, this sort of, uh, so he's a rabbi living sort of, you know, we can almost feel when he was living, compare that to Methuselah or Enoch. How, is, how did he make the list, the original list? Now, so the first thing before we touch upon these characters is notice that it says these 13 did not taste the test of death. Um, then we are told in the same Midrash, it, it's, I, I'll send you the Hebrew. It literally is like line after line. I've given you the words as is. Nine people entered into the Garden of Eden alive, as if we're talking about a separate issue. Now notice that almost everyone on the first list is on the second list, except the sons of Korach, right? As, as one of you mentioned a moment ago, uh, right? <laughs> There's this question of, uh, about them, but we'll touch upon them in a moment. Um, and then, of course, we have here someone else, Yavetz, the, you know, so it's a little bit different. I'm not going to get into the differences, but what interests us here for, for our topic of death is the first category is 13 people that didn't taste the taste of death. And then we are told that there are different people who reach the Garden of Eden alive. What does that even mean? Does it mean that they died in this world, like in the Bible, a, a character no longer appears, but they're there? Or perhaps does it mean that death is something else that, that you know, is, it, we, we can surely see already from this Midrash that it's a different take on, from what we read in the Bible, right? We're already sort of going, you know, to different heights here. Death is becoming even more complicated because we have here now two categories, people that didn't taste the taste of death. That doesn't mean they didn't die. It means that maybe the, the, the bitterness of death, you know, why, why is this Midrash wanting to differentiate between these two ambiguous things, tasting a taste of death and going to Garden of Eden alive? And now, now I love the, the, the ending. And some say Hiram was taken out and replaced with Rabbi Joshua ben Levi. That's just great, right? Like we had to make room for the rabbi. He was so great. We took out Hiram when he thought he was God. It made sense. So we did it. <laughs> but, but so... so in a nutshell, just to sort of before we're going to focus because our time is very short. Um, 
So something about the three sons of Korach that has to be said. Um, they started off evil. Uh, they were evil. They went with Korach. However, um, when we, uh, in this scene, this is, by the way, Gustav Dora. It's a, a 19th century artist, a copper, uh, I think copper plate. Um, uh, so when Korach, when they're all, you know, being swallowed up by the ground, okay. we are told that it's except for the three sons of Korach. They don't die. We know from the Bible they don't die. Moreover, there are Psalms. Some of King David's Psalms are Psalms that were written by the three sons of Korach. Now, you're in the Psalms. That's, pretty, that's like the Hall of Fame of, of Judaism, right? That, that's like Jackie Robinson. So, so how do you... So what did they do? Right? What is the common denominator of these 13 people or these nine, nine people that have something to teach us about death. Now, we're gonna do a bit of guesswork here, and this is how we're sort of gonna end this session. Um, let's focus on the daughter of, uh, of Batya, Bat Paro, uh, and then we'll conclude with a story about the rabbi, because we have to, because it's epic. Um, Batya Bat Paro. Let's pretend that Pharaoh is Hitler. Okay, we're going to do this purposely just to sort of keep it real. Pharaoh's Hitler, and he has the final solution. He has a daughter. Let's pretend Hitler's a bit older, and he has an 18-year-old daughter. She goes out to a camp. Let's say there were concentration camps in Berlin. She saves a baby. She not only saves a baby, she brings him home, and she lies to her father and says, he's an Aryan boy. He's from the Hitlerian youth. She knows. She, under Hitler, saves Moses. Now get this. There's a beautiful Midrash. A beautiful Midrash. Where, I don't know if you know, but Moses had a few names. He's called Ikutiel. He's called, his mother had a name for him. Miriam had a name for him. Aaron had a name. He's got like seven or eight names, like Jethro. They're very similar because it goes back to Cain and, uh, Cain and Ebel, but that's a different story. Um, there's a beautiful Midrash where God comes to Batya Batparo and says to her, he's not your son, but you saw him as your own. You're not my daughter, but because of what you did, you're my daughter. I see you as my daughter. And therefore, Moses' name is going to be the one you gave him. Not his Jewish mother, not his Jewish sister, you Batya, because you treated him like a son. You took him in, in Hitler's house. You raised him, and he became who he became thanks to you. He got all... This is an incredible woman. So if we go back to the, these, these people and, and do some research into it, because each and every one of these have a fascinating story. We'll put the Messiah aside. He's kind of like our joker. Um, even Ebed Melech. Ebed Melech saved Jeremiah when everyone was calling Jeremiah a traitor accusing him of treason. And Evad Melech was the guy who said, no, he's about to die. He risked his life. And Eliezer, the son of Abraham, I'm not going to even get into what the Gemara says that he did in Sodom and Gomorrah and how he got out alive and why. Incredible stuff. So, so there's something about these people, about perhaps a, a lifelong lesson, right? That through the way they lived, their actions lived on. Did they die? Did they not die? Maybe they did die, and what the Midrash is saying here is these are people that the lesson we have to learn from them is so powerful that it's as if they didn't die. Who knows? But, but there's some common denominator here. These are all great people. And to conclude, we are going to conclude with the story of the rabbi because he's the odd one out, and guess what? He has the best story. Okay. Um, for the sake of cognitive dissonance, I've put here the, the, the supposed burial of Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi in Israel, Note that this burial goes against at least four different Midrashim, traditions that tell us that he did not taste the taste of death. However, we have a burial site from in Israel. And the story goes as following. This is from the Talmud, right? So this isn't a later Midrash. This is from the Talmud. When it was time for him, oh, by the way, just in brackets, just before this story, the Talmud talks about a certain disease and how Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi would go and visit these sick people, even though they were contagious. And he, he was a great guy. He would risk his life to help other people however he could. 
And then we're told another story about him, which happens to be the most important story. When it was time for him, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, to die, the heavenly court said to the angel of death, go do for him whatever he wishes. So the angel went and appeared to him. Rabbi Joshua said to, said to it, to the angel, take me to the Garden of Eden and show me my place there. The angel said, fine, right? He's not in the mood, but okay, God's, the heavenly court said so, so he has to do what he's told. It's the hierarchy. You've got to love it. So Rabbi Yoshua said to the angel, give me your knife, lest you frighten me along the way. Yeah, he must have been a Galiziana. So the angel gave the knife to Rabbi Yoshua. When he arrived there, the angel lifted Rabbi Yoshua up above the wall and showed him his place in the Garden of Eden. Suddenly, Rabbi Yoshua leaped and fell to the other side, but the angel held on to the corner of his cloak. Rabbi Joshua said, by an oath, I swear that I will not come back. There was now a dilemma. The angel of death wished to retrieve Rabbi Joshua, but Rabbi Joshua had invoked an oath that he would never come back. Right? It's a catch-22. The Holy One, now God intervenes. Notice the story began with the heavenly court. Talk about hierarchy. Now God is intervening. The Holy, blessed, uh, the Holy One, blessed he, resolved the dilemma and said, if Rabbi Joshua ever had taken an oath and, it, and, that, and had that oath annulled in his lifetime, he must return. But if not, he shall not return. Since Rabbi Joshua has never had an oath annulled, he was permitted to stay in the Garden of Eden. Except we have one problem now, the problem, the pickle of the knife. But Rabbi Joshua would not give it to the angel. A heavenly voice, notice God has left the building, a heavenly voice went forth and said to Rabbi Joshua, give the knife back to the angel because the world needs it. That is a beautiful midrash. Right? Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, not only is he cunning, but even when he's going to die, he wants to literally save the entire world by taking away the angel of death's knife. Right? This is a great guy. He's thinking about everyone else but himself until his last moment. Right? This is amazing. So that, that's one incredible thing here, right? That, that'll give you, uh, uh, you know, that'll put you up there in the Hall of Fame. But, but the last part is fascinating. Give the knife back to the angel because the world needs it. This is a piece of information that we have not yet received in the other texts we have visited. Right? That the Bible, we don't yet know what death is. The Kabbalists will try and tell us a bit about how they view it. It's good, it's bad, it's momentous. And suddenly the Talmud comes and says, the world needs it. Now, this is fascinating because we could have asked, why does the world need death? None of us asked this question when we were reading the verses. Right? It's an obvious question when you think about it to ask. God says, need, need it. why do people need to die and then no longer be in the scene? Why do you need this? Gemara has decided the world needs this. It's fascinating. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, we have here then the grave of Rabbi Yoshua. Um, so if we go back to, to, if we sort of summarize before, if there are any final questions, we looked at the Bible and we looked at, you know, five verses to try and understand death. And we, we, we understand that it perhaps is even more complicated than life. And and then we conclude by looking at a, at a fascinating midrash, to me it's fascinating, uh, about people that didn't taste the taste of death and, uh, and other people that went to heaven alive. Uh, right? And by the way, our assumption is that all these people on both lists are no longer in this world, which, which, which surely must mean also something perhaps about death. Again, what is death? Um, and perhaps a common denominator of all these people on these lists, and that there are, by the way, a few other lists, but this, the El Kuchimoni seems to put together the sort of maximum options of the different Midrashim. The common denominator is these are people that there is a, there is a lesson, one could argue, that there is a lesson to be learned. That these people uh, made the most out of their life in such a way that the Midrash kind of says, you know what, they're, they're the closest to not dying as possible. They're, they're models to how you should live your life. Uh, you know, so, so, so this is kind of, this has been an introduction before we get into the Kabbalah, because we can't go to Kabbalah before we look at what the Bible has to say about death. 
And this midrash, we're purposely finishing with this midrash because it's like an interim period between, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, or the earlier midrash between Bible, Talmud, and and Kabbalah. Um, any any questions? Other than other than a thousand that we will w excitedly wait to see to, to be revealed. Me, me too. Me too. In that case, uh, so next week, life, death, and the Kabbalistic never-ending circle. Um, I will. Anyone feel free send me an email if you want those verses in Hebrew. I will send them. Uh, any other questions? Like I said, it's worth viewing that list in Yelkut Shimoni and those people. Um, and. We will meet again next week. Thank you very much and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Zoom class. Bye bye. Amazing presentation. I was a little nervous when I saw the how Kabbalah and then Jen, I, you know, but you're 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 building us up to. Um, if any so, of us want to invite others to come in next week, I'm going. The recording.